Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 518th New Social Environment Talk. Um, I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation um, featuring uh, Victoria Vesna, um, Amy Myers, Nina Sobel, um, Christine Davis, and our Rail Editor at Large, Anne McCoy, as host. Um, and we'll be concluding um, our program today with a reading from Tony Iantoska. Um, so be sure to stick around at the end. Um, before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. Um, we encourage you to check the chat in just a moment for several links of resources. Um, we also have somewhere sharing in solidarity uh, with Ukraine. Over the past um, 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at The Rail. Um, and please check the chat in a bit to, uh, for more information. Um, and now to introduce um, our uh, guests and host. Um, Amy Myers has exhibited at several institutions, um, just to name a few, um, the Mullen Gallery, um, Mocha Hudson Valley, um, Gallery Momo Tokyo Japan and American Academy in Rome. Her works are in the collections of um, the Guggenheim, Paris Art Museum Miami, and Fort Wayne Museum, um, among many, many others. Um, and Myers' artworks have been cited in Art Forum, the New York Times, Hyper Allergic, Art in America, Bomb, and also much, many others. Um, then we have uh, Christine Davis. Uh, is a New York and Toronto based artist who describes her creative process as speculative infection. She is the founding editor of the international journal Public Art Culture Ideas. Public venues include the Power Plant in Toronto, Haus am Waldsee in Berlin, Seal Museum of Art, Musée de Beaux Arts in Montreal, um, the New Museum, and Credit Paris, among many others. Nina Sobel is a multi-platform artist and electronic medium who originated brainwave drawings. Her work has been exhibited at or is in the collection of Dia, the Whitney, the Hammer, LACMA, um, MIT, the Getty, um, many others. She has taught at UCLA, SVA, and received um, CAPS, NEA, um, NIFA, Turbulence, Franklin Furness Awards, and an Acker Award in video. Artist Victoria Vesna is professor at the UCLA Department of Design Media Arts and is director of the UCLA Art Sci Center. With her installations, she investigates how communication technologies affect collective behavior and perceptions of identity shift in relation to scientific innovation. Victoria has exhibited her work in over 20 solo exhibitions, over 70 group shows, and has been published in over 20 papers and gave over 100 invited talks in the last decade. Um, and finally, our wonderful host today is um, Anne McCoy. Um, so Anne is a New York-based sculptor, painter, and art critic. Um, she's also an editor at large here for The Rail. She's lectured at the Yale School of Drama and taught in the art history department at Barnard College. Anne's work is included in the Met, um, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hirschhorn and Sculpture Garden, the Museum of Modern Art, um, SF Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney, among others. In 2019, she was or awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and worked with um, Professor C.A. Meyer, um, Young's heir, a parent for 25 years in Zurich. She has studied alchemy since the early 70s in Zurich and in Rome at the Vatican Library. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Anne. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to try to keep this fairly short because we have such fabulous participants today. First of all, 
right off the bat, I want to thank the Sam Francis Foundation. Uh, they gave me a, a grant that helped me to do research and actually gave me time to, to visit lots of women artists. And they also gave the Brooklyn Rail a generous grant to pay for this program and help us. Uh, I also want to thank Fong and Nick and Carolyn and uh, Charlie, Charles <laughs> and the coal crew at the Brooklyn Rail who uh, have are just wonderful. We all do it on a shoestring and it, it, they without without the rail, I don't know what a lot of us would do. Uh, why I did this, I, I did this actually for a strange reason. I did two pieces for the Brooklyn Rail, one on Hilma of Clint and the other on uh, Agnes Pelton. And when I was doing the Hilma of Clint exhibition, um, I was interested in, in the panel that Linda Henderson uh, from Austin did. And I, re I uh, on the fourth dimension, and I realized that Off Clint spent uh, uh, four years at with, with, with Rudolf Steiner at the Goethe Annam in Dornacht. And this was sort of a, a, a mystical center. And she was very, ex she was exposed to all of Steiner's writing on the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is sort of an ideal monist device for explaining the, the blending of art and spirit. A fourth dimensional space really has to do with sort of the intangible, what is intangible to the senses. Uh, my own 50 years of study in alchemy uh, certainly have given me an, an insight into this. Alchemy is all about the incarnation of spirit into matter. And now with the new physics and the realization that matter is not what we once thought it was, um, and, and people uh, discovering phenomena like uh, observer shift, we realized that the alchemists really were onto something and this kind of worldview is circling back around. Um, I am sure that many people, you know, running the MFA programs when the when they uh, didn't know what to do when all of their women artists, you know, were 66,000 people and there a lot of most of their women artists uh, in the program were flocking up to the Hilma of Clint show. I'm sure they really didn't know how to just talk about a, a, a woman mystic who channeled her paintings through, uh, you know, masters on the astral plane. So I, I think that this, the Hilma of Clint exhibition, if nothing else, really opened up a huge door and sort of took the needle off the record and we realized that there were other ways of discussing art right now. The second I, real insight I had into this was when I was writing the Agnes Pelton piece. And I was interested in her friendship with Helena and Nicholas Rorich. The Roriches, you know, were part of, part, were rushed, left, you know, before the revolution. And they had a radical educational program that broke down compartmentalization. So you had this, this kind of, marriage of between art, archaeology, theology, science, and mysticism. I was, and that really led me into kind of an interest in the spiritual branch of Russian cosmism. And there were sort of two main branches. Unfortunately, most of the people involved in the spiritual branch ended up with bullets in the back of their head during the gulags. And I became interested in someone named Pavel Florensky who was sort of the uh, Leonardo da Vinci of Russia. He wrote a book called At the Crossroads of Science and Mysticism. He also wrote a book called Beyond Vision, plus many, many other books. Uh, he was one of Russia's top scientists. And he also, uh, uh, Florensky was one of Russia's top scientists, but he also, uh, uh, he was also an Orthodox priest, an art historian, and wrote on, on uh, vision. And, uh, and he developed a whole system of aesthetics. It was really kind of snuffed out after he was killed in the gulags. The, the Bolsheviks kept him alive for a long time because he designed the entire electric grid for Russia. Then they put him in the gulags for about six years. And then finally in 37, they put a bullet in the back of his head. But I was interested in uh, in Florensky because he really, uh, he spoke of, he spoke of a kind of uh, world where, where he felt that, uh, he felt that uh, there should be a fusion of science and mystical faith. 
And he felt that this would replace a mechanistic view, a kind of positive approach to science. And it would replace an old epoch of Europe of Renaissance rationalism. And so, and this would constitute a new approach to art. So for some of us who've been unable to sort of fit into the prevalent critical uh, types of critical theory, you know, many of us are starting to read Florensky again and realize this was sort of a, sadly a path not taken. Um, it's been hard because with decades of critical theory, for some of us, it's felt sort of like a flat earth society. And women who are deeply rooted in psyche, in the inner life, and complex systems of in inquiry have had a hard time fitting into an art world of trends and, and standardized theoretical approaches. Florensky spoke of the feminine world as a world of the night, the unseen, which for me is the unconscious. And I feel that I was interested in the work of these four women because I feel that all four of these women do work that is authentically rooted in inner experiences. And this, and, and this really shows in the work. And they are very much in touch with unseen forces and spiritual dimensions. And it was the dimensionality of these women that I really liked. I'm gonna give a very brief intro because I really, Irish people are way too locations and I wanna shut up. So first of all, Victoria Vesna is sort of our goddess den mother with her department of art and science at UCLA. She's incredible. She's one smart half Serb, half Montenegrin in the tradition of Nicholas Tesla. And I wanted, I, I'm, I was always really impressed by her amazing collaborations with artists, composers, nanoscientists and stuff. But the reason I was fascinated, there was another reason I was fascinated with her. And that was in the seventies, I was working at the uh, Bauhaus archives in Berlin. And I came across this kind of wonderful uh, writings on this uh, about Johannes Itten, you know, that Swiss colorist mm -hmm. who used to sort of dress up like a yogi. And he would have uh, his students work with all of these meditation practices. And, uh, and I, I, I was fascinated because Vesna has actually used something called, I hope it's, I pronounce it properly, Breckmer meditation involving sound patterns with students. And I thought, oh my God, this is so interesting. She was in the operative section of the Venice Biennale and I, the, in, I think about 85 when I was in Arturo Schwartz's Art and Alchemy show. Uh, so I, the next one is Amy Myers. And I saw Amy Myers and I both grew up in kind of the, the, uh, the physics community. Uh, my adoptive father was working with something for the putting on the for coating the nose cones of rockets. So I grew up in a physics community with people like George Gamow and Frank Oppenheimer. Meyer mm -hmm. grew up in the physics community, and she also lived abroad, where her her father was teaching, and spent her time uh, with in the, watching whirling dervishes. She also is the only person I know who really explores things like string theory and the new physics. And when you look, I saw one of her paintings and I literally hunted her down and sort of stalked her for a studio visit because I thought, I mean, I saw one work and I thought this is incredible. So the next one, I'm gonna keep this short, is our fabulous Kristen Davis. And uh, I first heard about her through Jarrett Ernest because he's published a book through the Hofberger School of Painting called uh, Two Lives and a Dream about her work. And he took me to see her uh, Euclid project. And it was extraordinary. It's a circular sculpture with double hinges <clears throat> that hinge both ways that expands and contracts. And it's, it's, it was amazing. And it, it has to do with Euclid's work plus uh, Burns 1847 uh, edition of Euclid's elements. I love this because for me, it takes Euclid's three dimensions mm -hmm. and opens it out into a world that encompasses everything from Borges to Baroque music. So I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that she will toss in a little bit of her thing on, on butterflies and Hildegard von Bingham. And last but not least is the fabulous Nina Sabel. Now, Nina Sabel, it, I heard about Nina Sabel in the 70s uh, in California. And in, starting in the 60s, I'm really old, I'm 75, Starting in the 60s, I was fascinated by this man named Ted Sirios. And Ted Sirios 
was this man who could, I, how would you call it? I guess you would say he could uh, teleport images onto film. Ted Sirios would hold a camera, teleport the images onto a film. They would develop them and then there would be the images on the film. And so I was fascinated by this idea and I came across so, uh, Nina Sabel's brainwave drawings. She was the only artist I'd ever seen who was working with mental telepathy. And then we crossed paths again. We both in 77 knew Joseph Boys. I, I knew him from James Lee Byers at, in Berlin and later through Harold Zaman. And, uh, and Nina, uh, actually was introduced by to Joseph Boyce through uh, Carolyn Tisdale because of a piece she did in London. Mm -hmm. And the piece she did in London was called uh, In and Out the Window. And it was a piece where the, the gallery was sort of like all uh, blocked up and there was a little telephone on the ledge where meter maids and different people passing by could, could participate by ringing her up. And this would appear on two video, uh, uh, monitors in the back of the gallery. So this was sort of an, the, one of the first interactive pieces. So Carolyn Tistel told boys about this and boys said, oh my God, let's be paid her way, bought her lunch, put her up and brought her to document a six. And she reproduced this piece. So that was sort of my, uh, that was my next uh, interaction with, uh, with her. And then I met her later at Lenore Mallon. So I'm going to shut up now, and I really want to. I hope I didn't run off the mouth too long. Let's get Victoria Vesna up. Thank you so much. And Stardust to all of you. I am so amazed by the synchronicities and the timing that's happening. <laughs> uh, there's a change of time between Europe and here, and I teach a class. Um, and vibrations matter, the uh, art and science of deep listening to students in Austria. And it overlapped with this class. And I thought, maybe that's not, uh, with this presentation, I mean, maybe that's not by accident. So uh, we just finished uh, listening to sounds of cell vibrations and vibrations of butter, uh, chrysalis turning into a butterfly metamorphosis. And, then I jumped into this Zoom. So welcome to everybody and thank you so much. And I'm so thrilled to know you and talk to you. You're really, really a gem. Um, so Anne asked me to talk about, well, she asked me two questions. How did you start working with spiritual aspects? And then the next one was, please talk about your teaching and how you integrate it into your art. So I took a little time to really go back and think about it and locate the moments because there's only 10 minutes that I can wrap this into a story. And I'll just start by saying that in 1989, I had an exhibition at PS1 and I remember making a public statement that I will never teach because as an artist, you gotta be like a real artist and not teach because that's what I heard in art schools. That's what they taught us. Uh, and then I would never be a single mother because who would do that? That's crazy. And um, LA was not a hit at that time. I also publicly declared, I would never live in LA. Who would want to live there? <laughs> All came true. <laughs> and so, <laughs> never say never. Uh -huh. uh, but every single one of these things has been a gift to me. And uh, I will now backtrack to the 70s. When I was growing up in New York City, and my father was a uh, diplomat for ex-Yugoslavia, country that doesn't exist anymore. I was raised to think I'm Yugoslavian, not Montenegro, Serbian. So then you have to declare yourself, it's very confusing. Um, but he was really obsessed with uh, putting up a monument for Nikola Tesla in the Niagara Falls because everybody 
uh, at that point, nobody even heard of him, very few people. And it was just assumed that Edison uh, discovered electricity. We went to the hotel where he died. We went to Niagara Falls. And we went to a Princeton plasma lab that just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as a, a person growing up and a girl um, at that time, I kept studying art. So I went to high school of art and design in New York City. Then I went to the Academy of Fine Arts in Belgrade, ex Yugoslavia. Never, never was taught science or math. It just somehow skipped me, but I was always super interested. And that uh, moment is really the key where I would identify that well, kind of hit in my neurons that just stayed with me for the rest of my life. To this day, Nikola Tesla is in me and my genes. And my obsession with looking at the inaudible and invisible realms really also became very much central, still is. I also believe that because I was raised in a kind of a semi-communist environment, we were not allowed any religious uh, teachings, hardly ever went to church or anything like that. It was just structures. That not having math or science or religious education gave me a kind of a blank canvas for a search. Uh, and I was just looking for answers. How does nature work? And why is this? And why do I have dreams that come true? I didn't have these answers, and art school certainly didn't provide that, but uh, we kept going. Uh, so, this is a, a quote that I just shared with my students as well, where we started thinking of the energy, frequency, and vibration. And I'm pursuing that as a really important uh, aspect to think about. The scientists I work with uh, agree with me that everything is really waves, vibrations, and patterns in nature. So this is what I uh, am interested in and what I teach in relation to vibrations and frequencies on molecular and cellular level, uh, brain waves and space, uh, and then voice, our voice, our human voice, but also the animal voice and speaking to the other and how all of this expands out uh, from uh, individual to collective level. Um, so again, another moment that was key for my uh, forming as an uh, artist is when I, I got admitted to the Academy of Fine Arts in Belgrade in the painting department. It was very competitive, but I managed to get in. We got in this summer, and then we come back in September. The professor who I was assigned to um, said, hey, you know, I heard you came from New York in English. Can you translate the preface to the I Ching? Um, I misunderstood her. I spent the whole summer translating the foreword by C.G. the preface, and then going through it and explaining the whole thing to her absolutely stayed with me for the rest of my education and my life as a kind of a guide. And as I was being taught uh, art history, which was all white men, and it just didn't make sense. It was just the way they were teaching us art history was this happened this year, and then here are the key paintings, sculptures, and then so forth. So it just made no sense to me. Uh, I got very interested in alternative ways of reading and thinking. These are two books that I pulled as uh, ones that really made an uh, impact on me thinking about it. Uh, Consciousness of the Adam was Alice Bailey, who some of you may be familiar with. She was in the Theosophy movement and receiving her uh, texts through a Tibetan. So that took me to the Tibetans. And finding this book on cutting through spiritual materials and also is really amazing for me. And I know others will talk about butterflies, but this is uh, this was in relation to the blue morpho butterfly, which by the way, there's no pigments here. It is pure nanotech of our eyes and the patterns on the wings that create the iridescent blue. These are the uh, 
scanning electron microscopy of the cells of the butterflies, which is amazing as well. And here the visuals of the characteristics of the metamorphosis. And what, what's really mind blowing about it is that it's not gradual. It's like these huge bursts that then are really quiet and then bursts again. And when this was sped up and amplified, which um, you don't have time to listen to, uh, you can actually hear this incredible like explosions uh, that are part of metamorphosis. Uh, briefly, uh, some of the installations that actually premiered at the Integratron in uh, the desert, Landers, uh, Mojave Desert in California. This is an acoustically perfect structure that was designed based on uh, some of the ideas coming from UFOs and Nikola Tesla. Another long story I'm not going to get into, but it was a perfect place to yeah. do this project. Okay. We had a Tesla coil outside as well. And here's how it emerged. So you sit on an interactive pedestal, and the less you move, the more happens. On your head is the meteorological balloon as the projections are of the butterfly. This is another version with a, a net and the cocoons with silk. And then here was um, uh, in the governor's island, actually another version that happened a few years ago with harvest works. But perhaps the most spectacular version was in Poland, in Lasnia, and the Cathedral of St. John Divine. Um, she was actually wearing a meteorological balloon that's 18 feet high in the cathedral and basically lighting up the entire cathedral by his presence. The important thing about this work to me is that it really became important for me that the audience was the performer. Sorry. Let's get Amy Myers on, our resident Sufi. Amy, are you ready to go? I'm ready, I'm ready, okay. Um, I'm just screen sharing, just give me one moment. Okay, sure. This little screen here. While you're doing that, I just wanna thank Anne so much. Anne, um, I'm, I just can't say how happy I am to, um, have, to have met you and to be participating today. So thank you to everyone. Um, okay, so this is a, uh, a detailed drawing, a detail from one of my large scale drawings. Um, I've pretty much drawn uh, for about 20 plus years. Um, this, the title of this piece is The Red Giant Between Earth and Sun. The, uh, the piece is about 10 foot by 12 foot. And the um, material is graphite gouache conte on paper. Um, I use scaffolding uh, when I make the large scale work um, in order to deal, deal with the issues of scale. And um, each piece takes about uh, 10 months to a year to make each one. So they're extremely uh, labor intensive and um, fluid uh, dynamic. Um, so there's that. Oops, can we go back for a second? Yeah, okay. So um, about four years ago, I um, segued, uh, I kind of trained myself uh, into painting. Um, I kind of hit a wall with the works on paper, uh, mostly around light, because I've, I've always been like really envious of painters because they actually can use the chemical compositions of paint to trap and harness light. So the paintings have the ability to be luminous, whereas works on paper um, using the gouache, more of the um, absorbent materials. Um, I, uh, I, I needed that, I needed the luminosity. So I um, segued and taught myself painting. So this is, uh, that was a six foot by six foot oil on canvas. This is um, an example of one of my drawings. The title of this is called The Joy Particle. Um, and this is, my normal size is about like eight foot by eight foot. And again, that's Conte gouache, uh, graphite on paper. Um, okay, so I'll go a little bit into the content of my work. Um, as you have heard, um, I grew up in a house where we discussed science. Um, we discussed atoms, molecules, elements, uh, 
the quantum mechanical events of the subatomic realm and how those events do not correlate with our experiential reality. Um, atoms are not objects or things, uh, but they are tendencies to exist or probability patterns, the really empty space. Um, so it kind of opened me up to start thinking about uh, everything, uh, not as uh, objects or things, but as spatial events and, and dynamic interactions. Um, and I have to say it was, it completely overtook kind of my way of thinking and um, kind of blew my mind. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about quantum mechanics is that the idea of the neutral observer was kind of blown out of the water. Um, basically, you cannot know both velocity and the location of let's say uh, an electron uh, when, you observe, when you observe it, take a measurement. Uh, the methods of measurement actually alter the experience. So there's really no such thing as like getting outside of the box and looking in on something neutrally and observing it and measuring it. Uh, Einstein talked about this. He talked about the uh, describing the universe as like a closed watch or a closed clock. It's not something you can step out of that the very act of observation alters and influences the observation. So I don't know, that, that was like a very kind of compelling uh, way to start thinking about uh, myself and, and the universe. Um, so electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, the standard model, all particles exist with the potential to combine with and become different particles. They are intermediate states in a network of interactions and are based upon events, not things. Okay, that's my artist statement. So when I was about eight, my family moved to uh, Adana, Turkey for a few years. And um, I was actually able to go to school on a train for a while. And I visited areas of Turkey like Antioch, Tarsus. Uh, I spent time at Cappadocia, which was an early refuge of the, uh, the Gnostic Christians and was able to actually go into the cave dwellings and look at their like early clocks and um, their, their, their sacred spaces. And it was really very, very like impactful on my, my psyche. Um, at one point, my dad took me to Konya. Um, we went to the Supi Mosque, which is the, was the mausoleum of Rumi. And um, the Sufis are the mystical branch of Islam. And at the time it was the, the lodge of the dervish. So as Americans uh, back in the seventies, we were able to uh, participate in the whirling dervish uh, ceremony uh, over the course of a couple of days. And I have to say um, that that also really, really altered kind of my, my, my worldview. Um, really influenced uh, the, really the way I think. It was very transformational. Um, okay, so fast forward, we're back in the States. I'm starting college and I started uh, studying at the University of Texas at Austin. And I was taking um, physics, mathematics, symbolic logic. And um, I had the chance to take a theoretical physics class with John Wheeler, who, John Wheeler won the um, Nobel Prize for black hole theory. And Wheeler is uh, typically out of uh, Princeton at the Advanced, Advanced uh, Institute of Studies, but happened to be in Austin for a few years. So I signed up for his class and it was a really small class. There was about seven of us in there. And um, I remember showing up for the first day and Wheeler talking about the entire semester was gonna be one paper. And all he wanted to know was, the most outlandish creative narrative we could come up with the origin of the universe. Um, he didn't want mathematics. He didn't want equations. He, he wanted the imagination. He wanted um, something like illogical and you know, just the, the, the deepest, most imaginative we could get. So that also really kind of influenced the way I think about um, the narrative of science and physics. I kind of gave myself permission just to kind of jump in and play with science in a way and um, start looking at ways that I can create my own terms in terms of entering into this dialogue. So some point, um, a couple of years later, I ended up going to art school. I went to the Kansas City Art Institute as an undergrad and I um, 
mentored with Warren Rosser, which was very um, important for me to do. Uh, he really helped me um, kind of create the terms of my engagement in this dialogue. And over the years, like after, you know, much, much investigation, work, reading, looking, I have created a visual language as an entry point into this vast universe. Um, and I do have like the collected um, writings and diagrams uh, of all the years of exploration that I have I've worked on. So I do have that resource. So this particular piece right here, this was this is uh, this is the red giant between Earth and Sun, and you can see the detail was taken um, from the center, the bottom center. Um, so my obviously my work is symmetrical and. Um, Basically, like in all in the universe, like everything, all the particles are rotating. There's like left, right, up, down, rotation. So within rotation, there's a natural symmetry. So that's that's what's happening in my work is because everything is rotating, everything is spinning. Um, I do measure. I start with a vertical, and then I will go in with my scale, and I actually measure out um, all the different points in order to get you know this kind of solid symmetry. I work on um, several sheets of paper at a time. Um, I put together uh, sheets. So what that does is it kind of gives like a natural like longitude and latitude to the paper, which I then use to measure off of. So in a way it's like kind of related to map making. Um, so that's, yeah, and this is uh, the virtual underground red phase. Um, so, okay, so basically like in science, the areas that I'm like most interested in is like the discrepancies between like Newtonian physics and quantum mechanics. Both of the systems are um, highly predictive and they're also, um, they've been measured. So they both are kind of true, but gravity has been the big anomaly um, between these two, these two uh, systems. Um, Einstein's kind of life work towards the end of his life was about like looking and locating this like unified field theory. They needed to make sense of gravity because gravity shows up is extremely weak um, compared to the other uh, forces, the strong, the weak, and electromagnetic. So um, back in the 60s, Kaluza Klein was a, I think they were a graduate, uh, they were in graduate school. They put a theory out which they tested. And basically what, they're, what they've been doing is they started adding dimensions to the mathematics. And as they added dimensions, the uh, equation started to resolve. Like everything started resolving and there was this kind of beauty to it, this kind of elegance uh, in the equations that uh, kind of sparked, it, I think it sparked something in the, in the scientists that uh, had some type of like, rang some type of truth for them. Um, so this adding of dimensions uh, has been around for quite a while. Um, also from this conversation, I think string theory has kind of popped up. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about this drawing really quick. So this right here is titled Resilius Lati. And if you look down at the bottom with that kind of gold web, that was, I was thinking a little bit about a probability pattern um, in terms of this, this part of the piece, because um, again, it's just like, it's just a tendency to exist. Like all matter just has a tendency to exist. So you can't say where it is and what speed it's traveling at. Um, so these, these to me are like probability, like statistical patterns. Um, so back to string theory. So, um, string theory is, uh, a theory that talks about matter, all matters being, um, as emanating from a higher dimension, that everything is coming through uh, different dimensions. I think M theory has it up to like 26 dimensions. Um, and so that, you know, everything is coming in from, from somewhere else. Um, we can't test th string theory because we don't have the, uh, the energies needed to, um, to test it. Basically like the cores of black holes actually contain the energies we need or like the gamma rays that bombard tops of mountains that has the energies that we need. So it's basically um, untestable at this point. And uh, this is uh, 
Okay, this piece right here is called uh, Spin Zero. And up at the very, very top, I have this like little dot, like this red dot. And to me, that's that's the origin of the universe. And like everything kind of moved like from that singularity point um, and expanding out. So I think I've integrated a lot of my experiences um, before I got to art school into my work. And this piece here is titled The Virtual Underground. And uh, it has, um, this one is about nine foot by uh, 10 foot. It's graphite gouache conte on paper. And it is in reference to virtual, virtual particles. Because um, like in the theory of everything, you know, as we're looking deeper and deeper into uh, particles, the behavior of particles, they, they exist and then they, they pop out, they go somewhere. So they're kind of here, they leave, they come back. They're not gone long enough to break laws of conservation, but we don't know where they're going. So that's a little bit about the field now that I'm, I'm looking into is um, this idea of a virtual kind of existence. Um, I think that's it. Amy, that was so wonderful. And Victoria, thank you so much. That's fabulous. God, what a treat. I think that that was just wonderful. Both of you did such a great job. So fascinating. I, I think is Christine Davis going to come up next? There, this is for you, Joan. I mean, not Joan, Ann. <laughs> I made it at Joan's house. Hang on. That's in the way. Okay. So, um, I'm very happy to have been invited here because it's made me sort of distill some thoughts that I have around uh, how, how would I talk about spirit. So this is called, this is a morphochrome and thank you, Victoria, for describing structural color. So I don't, I can just jump right in. This is organized um, according to Hildegard von Bingham's um, visions that she used to have in Scivius. So this is her model for how the universe works, micro and macro. She had this idea that the micro and macro are each contained within. Within This is a very long project that I will do over a period of time. Um, it sort of vibrates depending upon which area you look at it. And it also reflects quite materially some ideas that she had around this concept of veriditas or the greening or vitality that flows through all things. It's true that I'm working with, with, with dead, dead things, dead butterflies, but so the underpinning behind that that fascinated me in what I don't know what that is, which allowed me to, to move forward is these, these come from a farm on the edge of the rainforest where they're in big nets, they, they live, boom, they fall to the floor, and then the wings are recycled. And this is a viable way of earning money, and then they're exported, and then you, and then becomes something else. So it has an ecological underpinning, right, where, where the um, disappearance of that soul moves on and becomes something else. So that will be, that's an ongoing project. And it also, this also just sort of reflects my interest in material, um, material and concept. I would say that um, the multiplicity of the life world is, is the subject of my work. And I'm very influenced by a philosopher and physician called George Kangiam, where he, he, he basically posits that you can't think of an organism um, just in terms of its mechanical and technical model, like how it works, but its milieu is also part of the organism. So in a way, I'm demonstrating that in this piece because I'm looking at the scientific and, and the divine. And I'm not thinking, you know, the divine as cloaking an entity, but as a, as a sort of topological space holder with, 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 with multiple potentials for, for non-mechanistic inquiry into our our place, what, how we are in the universe and the universe is within us. And I think I should talk to about the concept of wonder as well, which this other philosopher I like called Catherine Malibu, she talks about wonder as the capacity to give and receive form. So it's your, your interaction with yourself, your interaction with the world. And this relationship is what allows you to negotiate the world and feel empowered, right? That you, 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 you that this is a changing organic thing that we're involved in here, life. Um, but one of the things I've been reading in, 
recently through her is that neuroscience is starting to be able to look very, very in detailed ways at the brain. And then in fact, the capacity to experience wonder may perhaps be diminishing because our brains are plastic, they're constantly changing. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm looking at right now. Um, I'm going to talk over a video because a lot of my work is time-based. So I will just move in and out of the sound. Um, Euclid Orchid is a very important piece because it sort of demonstrates how I, how I work the relationship between projection and form because the light of the projector is materialized by the flower. So it, it gives it a form. However, the light is also allowing the flower to live through a process of photosynthesis and it's deforming the projected image as well. So it's that process of how things move forward in that state that really interests me. And I would say in general, my work is with um, projection like light or language. Which... Okay, so basically what we did was we did a, a performance where a singer came in and she was singing the collages in the key of Hildegard von Bingham. And we did a whole experimental uh, film shoot session where we shot, where we did rayograms using green developer and uh, a series of um, dancers that activated the work. And uh, then it, once I finished that, I wrapped it up on the pier and put the work into, into storage and spent some time trying to figure out what it was that I had done. Essentially the piece was my attempt to negotiate um, mathematical language with um, the language of the humanities, if you like, because it has Batai, uh, Arendt, Malibu, many, many different thinkers that are running through the Euclidean text to create this sense of a language that, accom that, accompl that accompanies both of these ways in be of being in the world. Um, Whitehead calls it sort of the building blocks of the world, the, the way in which we know how things live and exist, and then the psychic additions that dreams are made of. So how do you, how do these, uh, how do you reconcile both of those? The warmth of the sun, uh, the beauty of the sunset, plus your knowledge of the speed of light. And I have this feeling that we live in a world where that, that knowledge is increasingly diverging, right? Which is why it's important for artists to keep working with it, I think, to make things palpable and give experience to them and create, uh, create wonder. Um, so this was shot, this was a shot in collaboration with it, quite a few other people. And I, I, what I learned by the end of this project is that I had created what I'm calling a machine for thinking. Um, it's the screens, there are six screens and they take multiple shapes. It can be a circle, it can be a square, it can be a cell, it can be a labyrinth, it can be, it can be moved in all these different ways. Um, the text is meant to be uh, read and interpreted by a poet, by a cinema, cinematographer, by a dancer. And here I am just showing me understanding it finally at the end here and I've divided it into all these different categories and created a taxonomy of the different forms that the work could become. And I just finished uh, a activation of the work at a studio in the Lower East Side that was called The Elements. You can turn the sound up here for a bit. Oh, up? Oh, yes, please. I don't hear. If you want to turn the sound down a bit now. Okay, great. So this music was composed by Randall Wolf, who walked into an open studio I had one day in Red Hook, and he said, wow, 
I am going to do to Bach what you did to Euclid. We are going to collaborate. And it was the first time I'd actually shown how what the piece had ended up being to a bunch of people. And I was just was I had this overwhelming sense of wow, this works, right? It's 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 this way of connecting with other people who want to transform the world, if you like, or make a world and stage this. And this is is um, Candy Store, who is a poet who read um, and transformed the piece. And there was another poet, Simone Kearney, and um, it was um, Randy's music that played in the background with Kathy Sobo playing it. So you can turn it up a little bit here. We'll hear more of Kathy playing. My lips. I keep talking about putting red lipstick on my most sacred hole and kissing a rock, a loving swap for God to cherish something like beauty, to hold it so tightly in one instance mm. to commit to its undoing, holding it down by the throat until time comes, blots it out. Beauty is a belief with no need for believers. Beauty is an assembly of misunderstanding, neither bad nor good. And keep the voice up. Metamorphosis the four ages. Oh, now I am ready to tell how bodies are changed into different bodies. I summon the supernatural to first contrive the transmogrifications in the stuff of life. You is us for your own amusement. Descend again, triangle. Be pleased to reanimate this revival of those marbles. QED. Okay, that's, you can end it now. So that was Simone reading the um, collage where the, uh, four the, the four tales from Ovid is moved through the geometry. And it's the choice of the poet, how they encounter the diagrammatic space, right? Is it going to interfere with their reading? Is, or, or is it something they're going to punctuate? And, and Simone chose to punctuate the diagram all the way through. Just like when Daisy um, Press was singing Hildegard von Bingham, she interpreted the words, that's her singing the title page at the beginning, Knowledge of Life. But every time she would hit a diagram, like a triangle, she would use a um, note combination from Hildegard. So it's punctuated. The two are completely intermeshed in producing this other kind of third language, which is why I liked it to end the, I, I ended that with QED, which is, it has been proven that. Um, I don't think I have anything else to add, except this project had a very anarchic structure. It, it developed purely from a desire to cut into a book and rewrite it, which took from 2003 to 2012, which was the collaging part, right? I spliced lines of text from my own library, over all the explanatory notes in Euclid. And then I had to get another copy of the book and I cut out all the diagrams and then the diagrams are deployed into a series of collages. So the resulting um, assemblage is what I call a machine for thinking. And that's okay. it. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is so wonderful, everyone. I Now that we're, we, we want to, for Nina Sabel, we need you.
Are you on? <laughs> just share my screen one more time. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, I just want to say um, quickly, I believe that all living things are already communicating non-verbally and humans are just becoming aware of that ability. We're coming full circle and dropping our babble and joining with all of life in communicating telepathically. And that I work with the intangible energy, invisible forces, brainwave communication. And now I'll play a recording which uh, Anne originally uh, asked for, uh, a keynote recording. Hi, I'm Nina Sobel, and I'd like to say thanks to Anne McCoy and the Brooklyn Rail for including me and to everyone here listening in. Today I'll be talking about the visualization of interactive nonverbal communication that draws upon the social nature of the brain's electrochemistry as it reveals a deeper understanding into our internal dialogue made visible. My exploration of video's relation to the unconscious and thinking of myself as an electronic medium led me to conceive of brainwave drawings in 1972. Systems engineer Mike Trivich and I created one of the first visual interfaces for two people to communicate non-verbally by using a color organ to identify brain waves with color and sound. And then we used an oscilloscope. Here, internal and external portraits display brain wave synchronicity, perhaps telepathically, when a circle is formed. Vertical distortion indicates the person's EG on the left and horizontal distortion indicates the person's EEG on the right. In 1978, Ann Bean and I collaborated on her piece, Silent Conversations, telepathic drawings in which we communicated non-verbally, creating a heightened awareness of focus and made drawings based on these conversations, quoted from Ann. And now I'll play Brainwave Drawings, 1973 to 1983. Nina Savelle has been intrigued by the idea of being able to capture the emittance of electrical impulses by the brain and transposing them into a graphic image since 1973. She began to collaborate with systems engineer Michael Trivich. On the monitor, two people were able to see their physical as well as mental image they were able to create one composite brainwave drawing in real time. Sudell was determined to devise a non-competitive creative environment geared to home TV viewers who could create an active rather than passive TV viewing experience and enhance their ability to communicate. Dr. Barry Sturman of the Sepulveda Veterans Administration Hospital in California offered access to equipment as the director of the neuropsychology lab, he was most interested in the psychosociological aspects of the piece. Electrodes were attached to the occipital region of the brain, the visual cortex of two participants. They sat comfortably in front of the monitor, which displayed their faces and the superimposed composite brainwave information. In real time, Lisa Zhu pattern changed in accordance with the brainwave activity. When both people put out the same brainwave, it formed an irregular circular configuration. Verbal communication between the participants was the objective. When one person was distracted, it appeared as distortion horizontally or vertically, depending upon the axis, which displayed his or her brainwave pattern. The results were averaged through a PDP-10 computer and proved that two people could influence each other's mind states non-verbally. The EEG video telemetry environment was installed at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, Texas. It was open to public participation. Electrodes were attached to participants in the same manner as in the Sepulveda installation and an electroencephalogram was given to them. The public could view closed circuit monitors of the people in the living room environment and the graph being made. A video projector also played back what others had previously created. 
Soon after getting a job at the computer store, Sabelle began to collaborate with biocybernetics engineer Chris Matthews in using computer graphics to enhance brain wave drawing. With the support of Dick Heiser, experiments were made using his equipment and an EEG device from the Biofeedback Research Institute. During the following year, Matthews and Sabelle developed computer graphics programs for the piece. By 1981, after experimenting with different patterns, their efforts were recorded in Matthew's laboratory. John Gord built a special effects generator, and other equipment was donated. It was discovered that when one participant made a transition from one brainwave state to another, it often influenced a similar transition in the other person non-verbally. During the past phases, more emphasis was placed on the graphics. Now, attention was focused to achieve accuracy with the analog to digital device. The link between sophisticated EEG equipment and the Apple computer. After extensive testing, an environment was opened to the public at the Long Beach Museum of Art in the Artist and the Computer show. A computer program was created by Kong Lu, which resembled an electroencephalogram. Colors were keyed to each different mind state. The computer displayed an image showing previous brainwave activity, as well as the immediate responses. This allowed the participants to view their deeper previous states, as well as the current patterns, which were altered by the activity of looking at the screen. In 1992, this brainwave drawing installation was a benchmark piece, a closed circuit monitor inside the front window of the Bronx River Arts Gallery displayed two people communicating via their brainwaves as they watch their physical image dissolve with their mental communication. People on the street and in the gallery could see this. This is the first time that all of the questions, physical space inside and out of the gallery, the communication between the two participants, charting the brainwaves and a passive audience came together. The image of the two people walking towards each other and the background color indicated the length of time of EEG synchronicity. In 1999, at the Walter Phillips Gallery, BAMP Center for the Arts, Emily Hartzell, Sonia Allen, and I created four web seances. Web seance brainwave drawings illustrated Park Bench's commitment to address the physical disconnectedness of the information age by creating network seances that connected physical and cyberspace via neural telepresence and meditation. The medium is truly the medium in these seances in which a web-based artificially intelligent chatterbot leads the seance. The website gives the audience a place on the web to join hands, keeps track of those present and lets them know who else is there with them. During one of the seances, Meditations, Memory, Dream, and Fantasy, the medium poses a series of meditations to two EEG artists, one in Banff, one in New York. We watch their eyes and brainwaves and listen to their heartbeats as they ponder each one. Then they and we write about the memory, dream, or fantasy we've just inhabited. An artist in BAM transcribes their words into drawings on paper. Our stories fill a database from which a voice reads during the performance, mixing with the heartbeats. And they have, we all have an instruction on the page that every five minutes, a new meditation will appear on the screen. Think about it and watch the brainwaves of the EEG performers as they think about it too. After two minutes, a box will appear on the screen where you can write about your thoughts on the meditation. All the participants were identified by their IP addresses. In 1999, during the performance Solar Wind, Weaving Sun and Moon, Anne Bean was on a boat in the English Channel, while Anders Manson and I were at the Chateau de Sassy in France. We made one minute simultaneous drawings every four minutes, 
for one hour before the total solar eclipse. You can see here how they matched up. Please go to my website to see more of them on the timeline and many photos of the event. As we pass out of the shadow, I said at the time, we will know the profound experience people, birds, and all animals will have later in Eastern Europe that by experience alone, we will be closely connected to others. An article appeared in the local paper, emotions captured on the internet, what could be more intriguing than our own perceptions during an eclipse, mentioning nonverbal communication. Thinking of you, 2001, joined through telepresence, participants at separate physical locations see each other and transmit brainwaves and other human factors through the internet. The real-time convergence of this information flow creates a shared sensory environment for them and for public participants on the web. Thinking of you explores the space between thought and experience in this cyber and physical installation. Participants in physical and cyberspace perceive of the intricacies of personal communication by interpretation and navigation of brainwave energies. They see each other and one composite brainwave drawing they are creating together. By tracking the synchronicity of their brainwaves, an internal and external portrait forms in this meditative space for the creative process of our collective consciousness to unfold. Brainwave patterns are identifiable by color and tone, morphing and evolving over time by the group mind and interacted with at each physical location as light and sound sculptures. And this work brings my talk to a close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to say I am just humbled to, for such brilliant women. And I, I had not even anticipated you, how much this was all going to sort of meld together. This, the exchange was incredible. I just want to thank everyone. I'm, I'm such brilliant women. I just, sometimes I despair at the art world and I just wonder, you know, where where we need a place for this kind of incredibly complex, multi-dimensional layered thought. And I'm so grateful for the Sam Francis Foundation. I'm so grateful for getting to know these four women and seeing their extraordinary work. I think every one of you did an amazing presentation today. So I think, thank you. And let's let Nick, did we get a question or do we have time or where's our poor poet? Is it gonna be all right? Okay. <laughs> He's still there. Um, no, yeah, he's still on board. Okay. <laughs> Take it away. Whatever you, I know we all went way over. God. No, yeah. I hope everyone can stick around. Just, um, we got two really, um, well, we got so many questions, but we just don't fully have that much time for all of them. Um, but we would love to um, turn the mic over um, to Clarity Haynes. I'm not sure if you're still here, if you wanted to unmute and ask your um question about Hilda. Clinton. Oh, yes. Thank you so much to all of you. Wow. What an amazing, amazing, and yes, really unusual um, presentation. I'm so happy to have been here. So I was just curious seeing, you know, hearing um, Hilma F. Clint being mentioned in the beginning, and then seeing Amy's work in particular, I'm just, you know, I know that Amy, your work comes so much out of science. And, um, and I was curious how you, um, how you see it in connection to Hilma F. Clint and how, how you, what are your feelings about her work and that, that sort of spiritual legacy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, great question, Clarity. Um, I saw Hilma's work for the first time at the Guggenheim um, last, whenever it was. And I have to say, um, it was a astonishing experience for me, first of all, um, just the physical manifestation of the conceptual, 
our conceptual physical interests. Um, it, it, it really kind of blew me away. I never, I've never felt so aligned or so in sync with an artist ever before. Um, you know, her interests in uh, atoms and physics and um, just the way she kind of, you know, was introduced to the work and the way that she kind of hid the work. Um, I, uh, I, I just, I, I, I just couldn't, I kind of couldn't believe it, to be honest with you. And, and in some weird way, when I was going through the Guggenheim, like circling up and circling down, I felt like I was going through some kind of strange timeline um, that I really, really connected with. Um, it was such a, uh, a simpatico uh, moment for me. And um, I actually, at one point I, po uh, I posted um, on my Instagram feed, one of Hilma's drawings and one of my drawings. And I mean, there's, there's so many uh, like visual correlations, um, conceptual correlations to the work. Uh, I, um, yeah, I, I really was humbled by it. Also, I'm starting to look at Goethe's uh, color wheel. Um, yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's, she spent four years at the, she spent four years uh, uh, actually uh, studying Rudolf Steiner's translation of that of his of his book works on color. Wow. It, well, sorry, thank you so much for that. Um, and we just want to quickly turn it to our friend GE for the last question today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carolyn, Nick, everyone on the panel. This this has certainly taken us today every place we have to go. Um, question is. Can we suggest, as as Simone Weil, the 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 uh, philosopher and mystic, and uh, uh, said that as as perhaps modern science has erred in quickly lurching forward with the content of science without ever stepping back to see the thing at all, the thing being the ultimate subject of the study of nature of reality itself. Can is that answer? a question? Yes, it really is. It's can we agree with that? I mean, is that is that was she was she obviously on the right track of time, perhaps even summing up with what we're talking about today? Well, I will I will take it on for a second. I, I feel that working with scientists who work on an atomic level, um, it's not against the reductionism. You need to be focused on that level. But to have someone that's a comprehensivist, an artist on the sidelines, connect that to everything, to the universe, and talk to the scientists about it, creates this kind of magic in between space that gives the scientist a completely different look into the atom, and it gives the artist an understanding of the actual oh. physics of it, of the actual workings of it. And that separation of art and science is new. I keep saying that. It's not something that's, you know, something that we're rediscovering. Industrial age separated us and created these disciplinary boundaries and just uh, is being manipulated, actually. But to connect those two viewpoints at the scale of it is just so important. It's critical right now. I think it will save us. Uh, so this kind of work is just so, so important uh, for everybody. And I think it's a really appropriate question, uh, GE, that you're asking, because it really is about that. It's not about negating one or the other, but just saying it's the same thing. The word science, the word art didn't even exist right. until the industrial age. Science and art were the same thing, always. Right. Right. So we're just coming back to where we should be. And I, I also think that we're, I think we're, we're, we're experiencing a, a paradigm shift. I think something is really happening right now. This is a unique time in, in, in human history, in, in, in the evolution of the universe. Like it's, uh, it's a critical moment. And I think that, um, I think, you know, this, the shift has started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's 
it's very it's distracting. I think that that ability to hold both and understand both was very much the subject of that whole project with Yuko that I did. And I'm very curious now to work with other artists that are struggling with this as, as we all are. And the next activation is actually with an artist called A.V. Ryan, and she is going to do a play about Simone Weil. Wow. Oh, AV also AV also <laughs> reads Florensky. AV is the only other person I know who really who's really into Florensky. That's funny. Simone Weil was was fascinating. I think that what I found interesting about her was that she really, at a time when every so many people were sort of rampant secular atheists, she sort of said, "Wait, hold on." I know she was a convert, but she said, "Wait, hold on. We there is value in this. We really have to." understand the value of of what the what christ meant as a as as an, an incarnate being what in the the idea the alchemical idea of incarnation meant of bringing spirit into matter and i i think that she's she's in such an important voice and one that for many reasons uh, uh, people people have been uncomfortable with I, I'm just so grateful for all of these women because here you have four women exploring things in an incredibly complicated way. And I just pray that there is some room in the art world for this. You know, we, uh, it, it, uh, the art world is sometimes so consumed with one liners or pat this or pat that, that this is this level of exploration. I, I just hope there's a place for this. And I want to thank the Brooklyn Rail and for doing this. I mean, thank God for you guys. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. Thank you. Alchemist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> amazing. Um, so as part of our tradition and to extend this amazing conversation, one more amazing turn, um, we'd love to welcome our poet today. Um, and I'm just going to pull up his bio. Um, so Tony Ian Tosca is here with us and he's a writer, poet, and educator living in Brooklyn. Recent poems can be found in A Glimpse Of and Everybody Press Review, among others. And these poems um, are from a manuscript called Crisis Inquiry, forthcoming from Ugly Duckling in 2023. Congratulations. And um, Tony is also a lecturer in the English department at Kingsbury, Kingsborough Community College. So with that, go ahead, Tony. Thank you. I'm just going to read a few poems. Um, yeah, most of them are from that manuscript. So. And thanks to all the artists. That was really fascinating. Endless vacancies. It takes a common bloom to weld such noise to a day's endless stitch, splitting as clouds along the lower orders of windows. Exhausted mug glares a skyline sunned vacancies as you whistle away the eye that was for the eye that comes forward with new information, lots of potential and an expired contract on the blue earth ebbing deep like, yeah, you wish. So the poems with titles, I'll read the titles and this one doesn't have a title, so there's no title to read. <laughs> um, what we could do is eat a hard boiled egg together. Of all the activities there are to share with each other, I think eating a hard boiled egg together is one of the best. You can think about the whole world out there, whatever cash register or bruise, whichever war or skin it uses. But the seagulls and their special entrails from the ocean floor point the no nose elsewhere faces in the photographs just before, before the tear gas explodes or the table under the tablecloth, which supports the plate where the hard boiled eggs are. There's a smell of suntan lotion in this room. We have found each other here at the same time with these eggs, the shape of a concept, like the shape of a world and the places in it not yet shattered. We can eat this and then feel better without worlds and concepts brains frozen this side of the near ocean. Poem about birds and trash. There is a bird's nest in the laundry vent. There was a bird's nest in the laundry vent. There has been a bird's nest in the laundry vent since I last looked to verify the bird's nest in the laundry vent. 
I last looked at the laundry vent where the bird's nest was yesterday, and now it's time to check again to make sure there is still a bird's nest in the laundry vent. When I wake up tomorrow, I will walk downstairs in search of the most satisfying coffee anyone could ever want. It won't be possible, but I will make do entering what was to be with what could be instead, and then carrying that with me into what I actually do. The bench where I sit barely a detail when my head returns to its brain and the body appears sated as the spring puts off its work and turns its forward motions into the trash that gets stacked like trash in piles like trash on top of trash and trash underneath the trash, like a pile of garbage. This poem is called Optimal Solutions. Yes. It would be more interesting to throw a tree at a rock or something than to sit around expanding the edges of our factional ruts with our whining. Think about it. The regulator tells the device to operate according to the optimal solution to a problem that can be constructed from optimal solutions to sub problems, which require a throat's nascent rage. And there is no repetition since all nodes are leaf nodes, which contain the symbol itself and not the dirt whose time it is to be spat upon on the way to the checkout lane with as many leaves as there are symbols lodged in the wires unyielding phlegm. Optimal solutions yield pathways that reveal other obstacles that make the solution necessary again. In this way, our yawning feels productive and we sever the tree from its root structure and throw it at a rock to admire how smart we get to be. The device has needs and must also balance sleep with the destructions that come with being awake and the body has to be down with all this. Ingestion is a process that allows nutrients and toxins to enter the organism often at the same time and sometimes with the same effect, meaning the organism can be simultaneously strengthened and weakened. The body's aches can always be explained and the information will continue to be useful to future generations whose teeth we don't have time to think about. We change the channel as the sun keeps being irrelevant over there. Um, one more poem, if I have time. Do I have time? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is called A Map of My Interests and this one's in the March issue of The Rail. This is my name. I have strong preferences for this experience over that one. I could care less what experience draws me into its path. I don't think there is a path to victory. I think we will always be victorious. I believe only in victory, but not strength, because there is too much pain in that, and pain concerns me. I am unbothered by pain. This is what people call me. Here is how you can find me. There are pictures and relationships within which I am situated. I am uninterested in how I am located or if I am or if I will be found. If I'm not, then I am certain that I'm not. I'm not certain of anything and I'm uninterested in honesty or in being. There aren't any pictures and relationships are not what's important. In between is what counts, and we're not dumb enough to get stuck being either you or me along the way. The music you may hear along the path is pleasing. I don't like it. The path won't lead you anywhere, and neither will the music. I am near, nearing the end of the song, and in fact, I find it interesting when someone gives up before finishing the thing they're in the middle of doing. So I think that that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. That was amazing. Such a great reading to close us out. Um, so yeah, just thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Anne, um, Amy, Christine, Nina, and Victoria. We'd also like to deeply thank Deborah and everyone at the San Francis mm -hmm. Foundation. Um, and we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel. 
Um, that'll be uploaded shortly. Um, and please just join us uh, next Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Mel Bachner and Amanda Gluvisi. And please then turn your microphones on as you leave to say goodbye. Good luck. Bye. 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 Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Have a great Thank you, Anne. Thank you. And it's exceeded all of my expectations. I'm totally blown away by these four brilliant women. Thank you so Woo! much. <laughs> Absolutely you. agree, totally. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Keep up the good work. We are Thank you. you. I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to say goodbye. I didn't want to leave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And much love. Much love. Bye. Much Bye. love. And courage. Have a great Bye. weekend. You too. You too. Without Bye. Without, Bye. without the rail, Bye. all of us sort of old old <clears throat> lady druids wouldn't have a place to shop our wares. Exchange. We always them. there will always we'll be a place in. for for the druids here. Uh, for the druids. <laughs> yeah, always for the druids. Thank right. you so much, Anne. Thank everything. you. Thank you, Anne. Thank yeah. you all. Oh, thank this you. was so great. And thank you. Thank you, Nick and GE for great comments and Carolyn for keeping it together. It was really wonderful. Stardust to all of you. Oh, I love it, Victoria. Thank you so much. Thank for you, you guys. An amazing presentation. Thank you, Ed. Bye. Bye. Sorry, I ran over time. I was Don't worry. Bit... It, it, no it, worries. It was just, it, it, sometimes it just, it's hard to kind of coordinate these things. Uh, the... It's because I was, I just came out of class, <laughs> so I was like, you know, just in a different mode. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Everybody went over except for Amy. I think she's the only one. <laughs> <laughs> they her, because they had her presentation timed. I know. <laughs> well, I know, actually, Nina, too. She had the. Uh... She had it pre-recorded. Nina, you're muted. I, I, I made a, an 11 minute and 42 second pre-recorded keynote as requested, Anne. There you uh, go. Between you 10 and 12 yeah. minutes, between 10 think, and 12 I, minutes. I think I, I got it down to 10 minutes, and, I mean, 11 minutes and 42 seconds. Uh, you're awesome. Nailed it. <laughs> well, everybody's invited to a celebration of the spring equinox and the Persian New Year that I'm doing, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Nina knows about this. I do, I've been doing this for about 13 years with Siddharth Ramakrishna, a neuroscientist. It's a food and gathering and having fun and uh, spreading a little light this spring equinox. You're most, more than welcome. I would love your uh, presence. Do we need it? This has been such a dark time. Oh my God. We need it so badly. Oh. It so badly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for so sharing. I'm working with some Iranian artists, and we're doing it also in relation to the Persian New Year, the Nowruz. And people are coming in as animals of the Chinese zodiac, and we're going to eat and drink and wish um, with the suffering and for all people and sentient beings. It's really terrible dark time. But oh. this was a flash of light and hope. And thank you so much, and really. Yeah. Oh, well, thank beautiful. you. Beautiful. I, I mean, I just feel like I found four I, brilliant, brilliant people. You are all on such an, another level. I mean, I, it was just, I, 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 this went way beyond my expectations. We have to send this out now over the tom-toms in other ways, because it's hard sometimes, like even for me to do the Brooklyn Rail noon conversations, because so many of us have a structured work day. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of people watch it online later. Okay. I really like the way it overlaps so beautifully to see the blue morph and Christine's work. And, you know, I already talked to Nina so much about the EEGs and the oh, amazing and the 
amazing what? stuff. I mean, it's just all really connected into one beautiful thread. I'm just so thrilled. This was like food for the soul. Thank you so much. I loved like the, the dimensionality, the third to the fourth dimension. I mean, yes, yes. Very, that's very, an important very transition. Wow. God will bless. Yes, exactly. Bless everybody. Food. Bless everybody. So join us on Sunday for some good food and drink. It's, it's on Zoom, but you know, that's what we're doing now. So lots of love to everybody. Thank much you. And, and yes. Lots of love. Thank you so lots much. Lots of love. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Victoria. Stay safe. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.